Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, the title Alan has just read, uh, but basically this is a sort of repeat of the Brightspark lecture that I delivered in Iceland one year ago, a bit more than one year ago now. Um, and I've added some, some new stuff about cyclic loading, but we will see this in a minute. So, uh, first of all, just the motivation, because pile penetration in sand to many might seem as a sort of a simple, basic and boring, perhaps, problem. Certainly for my wife, it's a boring problem. Um, uh, but, well, in fact, it's, from a modeling, modeling perspective, um, affected by big challenges like large deformations, displacements, high stress, stress gradients, complex loading paths, grain crashing, and many others. So for this reason, um, pile design is often uh, based on empirical or uh, experiments and uh, field tests. So the, the question is, can, can we use numerical modeling, and in particular, in this case, the discrete element method to predict and simulate pile penetration in sands. Uh, in this way, we could try to predict the stress regime uh, 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 around jacked piles, which then governs the mechanical behavior, the capacity or the deformation, etc. And also use this numerical tool to understand better the mechanics. Well, to do this, I need two main ingredients. First of all, I need an efficient DEM model that can capture also grain crashing. And secondly, a benchmark to compare my results with. So for this second point, I will use some uh, detailed and extensive experimental data uh, done uh, by, well, led by Jardine and um, many others, postdoc and PhD students, collaborators, etc., using the calibration chamber in Grenoble they did a lot of instrumented uh, pile tests. So let's say the second ingredient is there and I will use it to see if my modeling actually gives something reasonable. So the outline is basically uh, listed here. I will first talk about the efficient DM model for grain crashing, how this is calibrated and how we set up a DM model for a calibration chamber do some pile uh, driving uh, simulations and compare these with experimental data. Uh, also some finite element numerical simulations in the literature of the same experiments. We'll then move to some micromechanical insights. So looking at the contacts and uh, where particle break, etc. And finally, before concluding, some uh, cyclic loading of the installed pile and uh, some interesting features there. So before I start, what it's DM, basically in the discrete element method, grains are modeled as rigid um, spheres, if you remain in the spherical. Now, there is also non-spherical DM, but uh, I will keep it simple and I use spheres. And basically the interaction between the grains is um, captured by contact laws, where you have, for example, uh, sliding uh, contact that uh, basically works like uh, what we studied in physics as a rigid body sliding on an inclined plane. So we have the shear uh, stiffness, the, sh the normal stiffness, and then we have a friction coefficient at the contact that if the, the shear force is greater than a limit, you will slide, okay, well, at the contact. So <clears throat> how is crashing of particles modeled in the discrete element method. There are two families of, uh, let's say, approaches. There is the bonded agglomerates approach, where basically the particles, so each sand grain is modeled as some bonded uh, spheres, okay, that are uh, through contact models that have cohesion, they are forming a single grain. And there is a limitation to this approach that basically uh, you have some issues with the porosity and also 
to the fact that these grains can break uh, up to a certain moment and then they can't break anymore, etc. But the, the biggest, let's say, drawback is the computational burden of this because they are quite slow because you need many more particles. Well, the other approach is the multi-generational one, where basically you have a mother particle, so you have your original grain that if reaches to a limiting failure criteria, it will then be substituted by some daughter fragments that will then move in space. And if they reach the limiting criteria again, they can frag fragment and break into, let's say, from daughter to granddaughter or the other way around. This is my mother and grandmother. So what do we need in the multi-generational approach? We need a failure criteria, breakage criteria. And in our case, we were inspired by some work in the literature on uh, contact forces on elastic spheres that basically can be rewritten in this way. You have a limit force. It's, it should be the force at the contact should be smaller than a strength times the contact area at failure. So once you have a limiting uh, breakage criteria, you need also a spawning procedure, so a fragmentation model. So my mother particle will be substituted by my daughters uh, into daughters with a pattern and you have to define this in, in the model and well we did uh, some work on this but inspired by experiments and uh, we finally came up to this 14 daughter splitting configuration okay now how we calibrate this model we wanted something that could be calibrated at the grain scale in an easy way and in fact if you do single single grain crushing test, so compress, compressing a single grain between two uh, metal plates, you can plot the data in a graph where you have a limit force against the particle diameter. And you see there is a typical trend here. These are also known as scale effects, uh, that basically the, the strength, the force is function of the particle dimension. And our failure criteria, if you introduce the elastic properties of steel, um, and of the sand grain, you have elastic properties, and then we have three parameters to calibrate. A strength, a variability of this strength within particle size, and this weighable modulus that for scale effects. So if you use the Hertzian contact theory to describe the contact area between two spheres, you can write the failure criteria as a strength times the contact area, and in blue here, you see that the contact area between two elastic spheres governed by Hertzian theory looks like this. And then we have this strength. Now, this, I said, there's an average strength at a reference diameter D0. And then there is a variability. How do we calibrate that? Well, basically, once you fix, fix sigma lim 0, and then the Weibull modulus M tells you the slope in this graph, sigma lim 0, the position in this graph here where the data is, and then at a single, so at a fixed particle dimension, for example, one millimeter, you can do many tests on one millimeter average diameter grains, and you will have a distribution of strength. So you can introduce that with the, the uh, variability that is introduced, for example, with the Gaussian distribution through this function f, okay? So we calibrate the model at the grain scale, single particle crashing. And then the model, the crushing model, was framed to be scalable. What does this mean? Basically, uh, we have the failure criteria. We introduced the scaling factor n here uh, that basically tells that if I do, for example, a virtual triaxial compression on a non-scaled sample, very small sample, 4 millimeter by 4 millimeter, uh, just to have a reasonable number of particles, you get a stress-strain response like uh, you see in the slide. Okay, now. If you scale the particle up to decrease the number of particles in the model, you don't want the crashing criteria to affect the results. So if you don't introduce the scaling factor in the crashing law, you will not obtain the same stress strain response. In this way, it is possible, and you can see to obtain the strain response, cut the computational cost down, and still uh, match the particle size distribution. So how did I calibrate this uh, model. Well, uh, in Grenoble, 
Fontainebleau sand was used. So uh, here are the calibrated model parameters, and we will see very quickly how you calibrate these one by one. First of all, the easiest particle size distribution. Basically, you just match the experimental particle size distribution by generating your spheres uh, that follow this uh, distribution curve. Okay, so this is the easiest. Then we move to uh, the non crashing response. So, if you have experimental data, for example, triaxial compression of uh, dense and a loose sand at low pressure where no crashing happens during the test, then you can calibrate the contact friction and then the elastic parameters of the sand. Well, the elastic parameters, in fact, don't really affect this response. So, these usually are taken from like the stiffness of silica, etc. So really, the, the, the value you want to calibrate is the contact friction angle. And then how do we calibrate the crashing model? Well, I've just shown you before the procedure, but uh, this time we, we selected some silica sand type of single particle crashing test. And in this way, we calibrated the, mod the model. OK, and these are the parameters. So once the model is calibrated, we can then do some validation. And uh, we did some 1D compression tests, so edometric compression tests at very high pressures. So um, we did, when I was at Imperial, we did these four experiments at different pressures. So we, we compressed the sand up to 25 MPa. We unloaded it. We checked the particle size distribution at the end. And we did this four times. And here we see the DM model capturing the, let's say, the, the formation behavior and the particle size distribution evolution with uh, stress. So we were happy about the calibration because in the end, this is a validating simulation. We also found on the, in the literature some experimental data on high pressure triaxial compression test on the same sand. So Luang and Tuati back in 1983 did these tests. And again, here we can see how the DM is simulating uh, without touching the parameters, and we were quite happy about at least the volume response of our model. So now that we have calibrated the sand, well, we have to fill a big cylinder with these uh, spheres and try to push a cone-shaped pile into the ground, well, in, in, this, in the same cylinder. Let's introduce some characteristic dimensions, so with symbols, so H, CC is the height of the calibration chamber, DCC is the diameter of it, and DP is the diameter of the pile. Now, uh, we also introduce these three, well, RD and NP as variables that tell me basically um, the size effects in a sense, so that this, the diameter of the calibration chamber over the diameter of the pile. We want a big number here because otherwise it means that we are pushing a pile that is too big and you will feel the boundary effects. Or the NP, that is the diameter of the pile, over the D50 of the sand. Well, here we have a scaling factor. So if this number is um, big, we are happy because we have a big pile with respect to the sand. If it's small, we are getting to see scale effects at the tip. Now. Uh, you can estimate the number of particles in a chamber and given a target porosity and geometrical dimensions with spheres, it's possible to estimate how many spheres will fit this chamber. And if you don't do any scaling at all, you will need loads of particles. So you can estimate that you need 300,000 million of spheres to fit this calibration chamber. And with DM, this is impossible. So how, how, how can we deal with this? Well, one thing to do is, well, we can reduce um, the chamber diameter, okay? But this, of course, will increase the boundary effects. And then we can also increase the particle scaling. So we have, let's say, a scaled, so a bigger sand, but this will decrease the cone tip resolution. So it, it, it's a battle here. You want a high resolution, but you want a realistic number of particles. Okay. So what did I do in, in this model? Uh, well, 
the final dimensions are in this table here. First of all, I decided to consider a shorter chamber, okay? So instead of 1.5 meters, I went for one meter tall chamber. And um, the second thing is how did I choose and what dimension did I choose to reduce the, the diameter was basically based on some radial stresses measured in the experiments by Jardine in Grenoble in the calibration chamber. And you could see that the radial stress with the distance from the pile were sort of becoming constant after 12 pile radii from the center. So this was sort of, I, looking at this data, I said, you know, I will use this as a, a, my criteria to reduce the diameter size. And then said this, well, this is the region that I'm okay. Now, how much should I scale? I did some preliminary pile penetration tests, changing the particle scale. In this diagram, you see uh, this, the cone, well, the tip of the pile in scale, and these in color are basically the size of the D50 with respect to the scale. And so which one should I use? Well, if you use the purple, you get this tip penetration. So this QC is this, let's say, the vertical force divided by, uh, the vertical force at the tip divided by the area of the cone for people not familiar with uh, QC in geomechanics. But basically we see that the stress at the tip is fluctuating a bit too much for the purple one. So I would say that the green one from the green scaling and smaller particles, I'm sort of happy. So again, I would say this is the region I'm happy with. Finally, what did I use? Well, I selected a even higher scaling, this white dot here, because I wanted to have the highest resolution as possible. Okay? So this is how I decided the, uh, domain, the domain dimensions and the scaling of the particles. And this is how the, let's say, the virtual calibration chamber looks. Here we have the particles, and then this is just a 2D section where you see the particles colored by diameter and the contact forces between these particles before the penetration. Now, it's a virtual calibration chamber because I can measure things and I can instrument it virtually. For example, through measurement spheres. So these circles, spheres that you see in blue, basically are spheres where you can uh, do an average and calculate stress using the contact forces and the volume of the spheres. And the other thing I did was to, at certain times, I could do and assume axisymmetric conditions. And through 458 annular rings, I was able to do the same averaging technique to calculate stresses and assuming stresses and uh, porosities, etc. Assuming axisymmetric conditions, then we can plot these and see that our porosity in the sample is more or less uniform. There is a little variability as uh, reality and uh, as one would expect. And um, the stresses are very similar to the target initial stresses of the experiment. So now that everything is ready, we have instrumented it virtually, let's try and uh, to, to push the piling. So uh, let's compare this with finite element simulations from the literature and the experimental data by Jardine and co-authors. So first of all, monotonic jacking. I pushed the, the cone at a constant velocity, and this is what you obtain. So in blue, we see the experimental data by uh, Young and uh, co-authors. In red, uh, finite element simulation. And green here is the DM model if crushing is switched off. So the uncrushable sand would behave like this. Now, if you turn on the crushing, this is what you get. So um, I was quite happy when I saw this. And um, well, because the, the model was calibrated through element tests. And we, I was also happy to see that the ratio between the uncrushable and crushable response of the silica sand calibrated in this way lies uh, very well and fits well with other experimental data where the tip, um, so the, 
crashable and uncrashable is, for example, for, for Wesley was silica that is uncrashable and pumice that is crashable, so the ratio there, or same from these other um, uh, works between Ticino and Q sand, okay? And this is another DM work we did on pumice sand. So I was happy also to see that this study, the trend was actually fitting with previous data. And um, what about uh, cyclic jacking? Because in reality, the experiment uh, was done in the following way. The, the, the pile was pushed and then unloaded and then pushed until the one meter penetration. So this is what you obtain in the DM. So the first 10 centimeter push, and then when I pause, and here, as I do this, I put in contour um, the radial stresses, the circumferential stresses, the vertical stresses, and the principal stress directions throughout the simulation. So here I'm in the pause, and then I push again, and then I pause, and I push again. And, well, this is my favorite slide of the talk, just because of the colors. But uh, as you push and pause, one thing it's really interesting that is developing in our uh, virtual sand, okay? Uh, in particular, this is quite visible when we pause. You see that you you have a sort of stress buildup, okay? That is not adjacent to the pile, but at a certain distance. So this is sort of uh, effect that we will investigate later from a micromechanical perspective to try to understand what's going on here. Why is this happening? And um, so we also can conclude that the cyclic jacking is giving the same pile penetration response as the monotonic one, okay? And um, so this was uh, something quite interesting. So the macroscopic, let's say, uh, I would say mesoscopic pile penetration curve is captured well by the DM. In Jardin's um, calibration chamber experiments, they were able to measure stresses within the soil sample. So, for example, we see in this slide here, uh, the experimental data here, were at three okay, fixed lo locations in the experiment and also in my DM model. I will monitor, in this case, the radial stress as the pile moves down. So, for example, if I penetrate, I can see, well, I display on the left the particles as, as they, they move, but colored by uh, the displacement, and then here on the right, the contact forces, and at the measurement spheres, I'm measuring stress. So, what does this mean? At this moment of penetration, in the red position, I'm measuring this red stress, okay, the ground. Whereas you know, at the blue position, in this moment of penetration, I'm measuring this radial stress, okay? Normalized by the tip. And again, in the green one, in this moment, I'm measuring this level of stress. Now, if I go on with penetration, I see also that the stress at the bottom, let's say, uh, measuring uh, um, sensor is increased, etc. That the good fit with experimental data was also very reassuring. Now, these are radial stresses at fixed position as the pile moves, okay? Um, and we can also measure this in as we move away. So let's look at, at the middle of the sample at three different distant, uh, radial distances from the pile. And we see here the radial, the circumferential, and the vertical stresses with the experimental data and also finite element simulations by uh, Zhang, Einav, and others, okay, where they used a large um, deformation simulation in Abacus. Now, with, with the breakage model, so we see that uh, the, the DM is giving very, very good results and ca that can be compared with finite element simulations. So, uh, these were at fixed location as the pile is moving, whereas I will also display results where stresses at uh, fixed instance at different locations of the tip. So basically what I want to show is that uh, 
uh, when I'm in a steady state, okay, even if I've penetrate, I've gone through 20 centimeters or half meter or 80 centimeters, and I look at it during the push phase along this line, I can plot the stresses and I can compare with the experimental data. And we see that in this red, blue, and green lines, we are basically in a steady state and we, we also fit very well with the uh, experimental results. So this is in the push phase and in the, po uh, in, in the pose, okay, we can look at different points, not below the tip, but above it. Okay, so to see the arching that we were actually seeing before. So during push, there was just some um, finite element data to compare with the, our DM results. And we were quite happy to see that the peak and the trend is, is similar. And uh, in the pause conditions, instead we had the data from uh, the experiments. And we also see that we have this sort of in the blue, red, and green lines, uh, trends from the experiments. So uh, to, now that I've reached this point, the question is, we have this effect. And the question is, why is this happening? So we have a tool that is the DM that can be used. And perhaps the question was, uh, is particle breakage sort of influencing this? And uh, what I did basically was compare the crushable and uncrushable response. For example, here I show uh, the radial, vertical, and circumferential stresses as you move away from uh, the pile for this, uh, uh, at, at this location, okay? And we see I color this selected region, the contact forces scaled by the contact force magnitude, the radial stresses, so, the red ones are highly loaded, the blue ones a bit less, and whatever is below 0 0.7, I don't even show. So we see that there is a concentration of circumferential stresses, highly stressed particle that form a sort of uh, uh, arch around the pile, and that this circle is not, so the radial stresses basically are prevented to getting to the pile because there is this arch that does pre prevents the radial stresses to get to the pile. And if we compare the uncrushable response, we see that, in fact, this circumferential arching is less evident, OK? Um, it's not that it's completely uh, disappeared, but it's less evident. So um, now moving on, and Giovanni, dai, per favore. So moving on to the, I have Giovanni. Say hello and then go out. <laughs> so let's move on to look at where are particle actually breaking. So if we look at, oops. So if we look at the location of where the fragments are at the end of penetration, we see them as this. Uh, and if you introduce the breakage index, that basically is something related to the particle size distribution and how it evolves and an area, uh, I will not, I mean, if you're interested, we can discuss later, but basically it's telling you how the particle size distribution is evolving. We see that our simulation are giving uh, similar trends to the finite element uh, simulations I was talking before. And the interesting thing is that if you look where particles actually break throughout the penetration, this is happening only below the tip. So there are no crashing events happening on the shaft, okay, uh, due to shearing or uh, at least for this sand that is quite strong. So everything is happening below and just very close to the tip, which is sort of reasonable and which is actually observed experimentally, for example, through acoustic emission events uh, measured uh, in the lab or uh, through um, uh, by, by looking at uh, experiments uh, in Purdue, basically, where you have half a, a cone in a plexiglass and, and, and you look at where crashing is happening and you see it's, it's just below the tip. So we were happy to see this also in, in the DM and, and, and confirmation. So trying to 
look for an explanation of what is happening, I started also to look at the displacement field of the particles below the tip and around the pile as it moves down. So it was also reassuring to see that the displacement field is very similar to what observed in, uh, from DIC imaging from the previous research group that I, was, I just showed in Purdue, and also uh, in Grenoble by uh, in this PhD work, and uh, well, this image was uh, uh, provided by, by Chino Vigiani, but basically you see this is a very small uh, pile, miniature pile in a tomograph where you actually can look at the grain and, and visualize them and then through image analysis recreate a displacement vector of each single particle. So we were happy to see such a correspondence between experiments and our DM model. So what I tried to, to do then is to explain this arching. I looked at the displacements of the particle, for example, the incremental displacement during, let's say, 10 centimeter penetration. So I color my particle in red, okay, if they move away from, let's say, the center, and blue if they move back, okay. Now you see that uh, in the push phase, uh, th there is not really big difference between the two, but in the between an uncrushable and a crushable response. But in the pose, you see that uh, the uncrushable model has more blue. Basically, this is saying particles are able to get back to the shaft, and therefore, if they're able to get back to the shaft, they're able to impose a radial stress. Okay, and so this arching is not as evident. Uh, and perhaps this is a micromechanical interpretation or possible explanation of what's happening. So the arch created in the crushable situation model is preventing particles to get back to, to the shaft. So is this an explanation? Uh, I don't know, but maybe we could look at this with more, more detail and, and, and trying to, um, but I think it's quite reasonable. So before I conclude, I will just give a, a brief uh, show about the axial cyclic response of this um, of this same calibration chamber. Because later on in, in, in Grenoble, these uh, model piles were then loaded cyclically, so axial cyclic loading. So here I, I display this time the capacity. Okay. Uh, so the vertical total force, so black Q, and then in green is what the tip takes, and in red is what the shaft, the total force on the shaft. Okay, so we see our DM results, and we see the base tip value of the experiment. So, um, and then we also see that our experiment, so. Uh, sorry, our, the DM is, is also capturing this, uh, uh, well, of course, in terms of forces, because the stresses were working properly, so uh, uh, the forces too. But um, I'm just going to reason in total forces, because the cyclic loading will be in total and um, forces and not stresses. So what happens is that w when you, of course, you push and then you unload, okay, uh, you have a total Q that is zero. So basically, you're in a situation where you have there is the, the base force is equilibrated by the shaft. Okay, um, and this is the situation in that moment. And we see well, we had this arching. We had seen this, and then this is the porosity. So we are a bit denser. So uh, close to the shaft, of course, a pile has taken the place of what was not there before, and uh, uh, this is so the initial condition for the cyclic loading. Just before I move to the cyclic loading results, is just showing that uh, the sh shear stresses on the shaft in the push and in the pose, okay, for our DM, the continuous lines, where the distribution of these shear stresses is similar to the experimental uh, experimental results, okay. Now. Uh, we are going to look at the pose situation, okay? Uh, 
And in this situation, we are going to axially cycle our pile, starting from a mean Q, so uh, an unloaded at the head of the pile. Uh, so Q is equal to zero, and then increase this, and we will have four cases. One where delta Q is 500, uh, newtons, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, okay? Sorry, Q, kilonewtons. Sorry, 500 newtons, so 0.5 kilonewtons, 1 kilonewton, 2 kilonewtons, and 4 kilonewtons as for some of the experiments, okay? And uh, this is what we observe. So um, this is, let me, so this is QS0, okay? And this is QB0. Okay, the initial values, okay, I'm going to fluctuate about. So just to give you an order of magnitude. So this is the shear minus 2.7 and 2.7 is the value about which were uh, the initial uh, values, just to give you an order of magnitude. And uh, this is the tensile capacity if you pull it out. So we're going to cycle far away from the tensile capacity of this pile. And this is what you obtain. So um, I show the tip displacement as you cycle, and you see that for case A, B, and C, basically there is the displacement is practically zero, despite we do many cycles uh, here 500. But for the case of 4,000, sorry, this is four kilonewtons, we basically uh, fail the pile because of cyclic loading, and this other graph is showing you how the shaft component and the base component are changing for the same test. So we see that as you move with the number of cycles, the shaft is uh, going from negative to more negative values to towards a zero average. And basically, the base is losing its uh, initial 2.7 kilonewtons, whereas for cases a, B, and C, nothing is really happening. And then if you look at and you compare from the experiment in case D, there was an ex the experimental data that showed how the tip displacement was evolving with the number of cycles. And we see that the DM is capturing the, the failure intention, well, due to cyclic uh, loading. So it's a metastable case where basically after a relative low number of cycles, you fail the pile because of this axial cyclic loading. And uh, just quickly, for case A, so this is the average radial stress on the shaft, and uh, sorry, uh, radial stress on the shaft, and this is the average shear stress on the shaft. So basically, nothing is really happening, whereas in the case D, the one that fails, you see that the radial stress is decreasing. And if the radial stress decreases, it's because, well, more Coulomb tells us that the, the well the shear stress will decrease because of uh, and therefore if the capacity decreases then you will fail when um, you pull out uh, you impose the, the the force at the head of the pile so this is the last slide to show you some interesting feature about what's happening to uh, the porosity and the mean effective stress. Um, so you see that in case A, nothing is really happening. But in case D, we have the mean effective stress is decreasing. So it's like you're unloading. But at the same time, uh, you are uh, dilating as well. So the change in porosity is, is, is negative. Or the other way around, sorry, you're densifying the soil, but the stresses are decreasing. So um, I mean, I don't have more data on this. I need to, uh, well, I have the data. I, I didn't have time to analyze this more, but I think it's an interesting feature where you see something that is densifying, uh, it's unloading. And, um, but yeah, this is just a taste of this. So uh, this is what is happening. Why? Well, I don't know. And uh, I would like to have time to, to look at this in more detail. So I will go to the conclusions that uh, basically I started with a goal that was trying to convince you that uh, 
the DM can can be used and it's a, an effective tool to study this type of problems. And uh, I, looking at this definition of what, what a model is, I would say that adding figures to the definition and this last image, I hope that I was uh, uh, well able to to fulfill my goal in a sense. Last slide is that I don't want to say that DM wants to uh, uh, replace everything and we forget about finite element modeling, etc. I just think that this is a very useful tool to work with experiments to guide and interpret them uh, interpret them better or to use to calibrate macro element models. Also in the centrifuge and scaling laws, it can be used and we're using it uh, with the geotech group in Dundee and uh, it can also be useful for a benchmark for continuum formulations as these experiments are very well controlled, well, these virtual experiments. And um, with this, uh, I would like to thank you. And if there are any questions, uh, well, sorry, maybe I was a bit long. And sorry for the no, interruption no. by Giovanni. <laughs> <laughs> Adds to the fun. No, not at all, Matteo. Thanks very much for your 